Hi, Terry Shaneyfeld for UAB School of Medicine. In this video, I'm going to cover some basic principles about screening. I'm going to cover when the disease is appropriate to be screened for, what test characteristics a diagnostic test should have for screening, and importantly, the patient characteristics that make screening appropriate. So screening is the identification of a disease or risk factor in asymptomatic individuals. Down here at the bottom I have a model of a disease. So at some point there's biologic onset and then it has its course to developing outcomes. Well often what happens with a disease is that it takes some time from onset before we make a clinical diagnosis. And it's during this asymptomatic phase before clinical diagnosis, which is where we do screening detection of diseases or risk factors. So let's talk about some basic fundamental principles of screening. And these are perhaps the three most important. One is that the disease must have a great enough burden of suffering to make it worth our while to screen for it. Two, the screening test has to be able to identify the disease earlier than usual, earlier than just clinical diagnosis. And finally, earlier therapy has to lead to better outcomes. It makes no sense to find something earlier and try to treat it. It makes no difference. So these are three, three very important principles of screening. So some other concepts to remember is that the target disorder that we're screening for are usually pretty rare. So that means they have a low prevalence in our entire population. And this will be important for when we interpret the test results. We have to screen large numbers of people to find the few that have that particular disease because these target disorders are fairly rare. And key thing to remember is that most positive tests that we have are going to be false positives. They're not going to have the disease. They're going to have something else. Think about if you do PSA screening, most of the elevated PSAs you've seen were probably related to BPH and not prostate cancer. The risks of screening are fairly rare, but everybody has that risk of doing the test. And unfortunately, the benefits of doing those tests accrue to only a very few people. So risks often outweigh the benefits in many screening programs. So one of the things I want you to do is think about the characteristics that make for a good screening program. There are three different classes I want you to think about, disease, tests, and patient characteristics. Let's for a minute focus on the disease characteristics. Pause the video. Think about what makes a disease a good candidate to screen for. And after you've thought about it, restart the video. So what do you think? So first off, the disease has to have serious consequences. It has to have morbidity associated with it or mortality. It doesn't make any sense to screen for something that really doesn't have much clinical impact. So we don't screen for toenail fungus, let's say, because it really doesn't matter. It needs to be relatively frequent, so it's worth our while to try to find this disease in our population. It'd be nice if it has a long preclinical phase, that asymptomatic period before clinical diagnosis. It gives us more time to try to find the disease. And finally, we must have effective therapy. It makes no sense to find something that we can't help the patient about. Now earlier in the in the second slide I talked about that there's usually low pro prevalence of disease um, in the population and with a low prevalence of disease always equals is a low predictive value of that test meaning if the test is positive there's a low probability that patients have disease. So what we try to do is optimize screening populations by trying to improve and make the prevalence higher. So for example, we don't do breast cancer screening in 20-year-old women. There are some 20-year-old women who will develop breast cancer, but the prevalence is so low that it's really not worth um, looking for for those few people, unfortunately. Now, what we do do is start screening at a later age, and at a later age, the prevalence goes up and makes our screening a little bit more worthwhile. And what I've tried to show in this table is that I've made a pretty darn good test that its sensitivity and specificity are both 95%, has a very good positive likelihood ratio. Anything over 10 is a really good test. And what I've done is varied the prevalence here from 0.1% up to 10%. And you can see what this means, that if they have a positive test at each of these prevalences of, of disease, what's the chance that this person really does have disease? So all positive tests do not mean people have disease. And you can see in low prevalence populations, so one in a thousand people having disease, 
even if you have a positive test, is a little bit less than 2% chance you actually have disease. So you can see how this varies um, based on prevalence of disease, your positive predictive value. And if you don't remember any of this, I have a, a video called Predictive Value Estimates from Studies Can Be Misleading on YouTube and goes through this in a little bit more depth explaining why this relationship happens. So what are the consequences of low disease prevalence? Well, it means that most of the positive tests you see are going to be false positives and we're going to do lots of fruitless workups. We're going to be doing confirmatory workups on a lot of people and we're not going to find much in them. And so, for example, there's some data showing uh, in breast cancer, what's the chance of finding cancer after an abnormal mammogram varies by the age. So in younger women in their early 40s, we have to work up 57 women to find one malignancy. But as they get older, we work up much less to find one malignancy. So again, that low prevalence um, has an impact on the number of women we find with disease, and most are going to be false positives. Now, the more tests that you order, the greater the chance of a false positive result. And so the percentage of normal people with at least at one abnormal test, if you run that same test over and over and over again, can be expressed by this formula, 1 minus 0.95 raised to the n. And the n is the number of tests that you do. And this table here shows that if I do one test, there's a 5% chance it could be falsely positive. This gets back to sort of the p-value of 0.05. But look, if I ran 20 tests and it's not that uncommon that people will get lots of tests, there's a two-thirds chance at least one of them will be falsely positive because these are, again, are normal people. So keep that in mind. The more tests that you do, the greater the chance, no matter what, that you'll find something falsely positive. Now, there's some empiric data on this that I thought I'd share with you about in mammograms that was published some time ago now in, in the uh, New England Journal of Medicine, but it was really an important article. And one of the things, if we just focus on the mammography section, that younger women have a greater false positive risk than older women. And interestingly, if you do a mammogram every single year, starting women in their 40s, by the end of that 10-year period, half of the women are going to have a false positive mammogram. So very important to recognize that the false positives are a real thing um, and happen quite commonly. So let's shift gears here. Now I want you to think about the test characteristics that make um, for a useful test for screening. So pause the video for a minute, think about that, and then restart to see how I answered. So what do you think? If you're going to do a test and you can only choose a test that's either highly sensitive or highly specific, which one do you want? Do you want a highly sensitive test or a highly specific? Well, what I want, if I can only choose one, would be a highly sensitive test. I don't want to miss those few cases of the disease that are out there. A very sensitive test will detect everyone. I also need it to be sensitive early in the disease course. Again, I need to find disease early where I can intervene and prevent the outcomes. But <clears throat> specificity is good. The higher the specificity, the fewer the false positives but it's very difficult to find very highly sensitive and highly specific tests. I'd also like it to be cheap if possible and acceptable to patients. I don't want a lot of side effects. I'd like it to be convenient. So these are the characteristics that make for a very good screening test. Finally, let's finish up on thinking about the patient. So what patient characteristics should we think about when we decide to screen someone? Pause the video for a minute and restart it after you've thought about this. So what do you think? Well, importantly, patients have to have a reasonable life expectancy. They need to live long enough to reap the benefits of our screening program. It makes no sense to do screening tests for people who are dying of other diseases, have advanced heart disease, advanced lung disease, have some other cancer. And I see it all the time that people will order screening tests on people that are likely to die of their underlying diseases more so than the disease they're screening for. They also have to be a candidate for follow-up studies, and this has to do with either their morbidity or their desires. So I have seen patients get, for example, fecal occult blood testing. It comes back positive and they refuse colonoscopy because they never wanted colonoscopy. So it makes no sense to do that one test if they're not going to follow up in the diagnostic uh, process. So I always encourage people to ask patients, if this test is positive, the screening test, are you going to be willing to do that next step? If the answer is no, don't do the screening test. Also think about their other diseases. If they've got very advanced lung disease, it's very unlikely that a surgeon is going to be able to operate on them if they find, let's say, a colon cancer in those patients. So think about that they're going to live long enough and that they are able to get and want to get the follow-up studies if their screening test is positive. If this video has helped you understand 
the test, disease, and patient characteristics that lend themselves to optimal screening. Remember, if you have any questions, you can contact me through the course website or through the Contact Me section of my blog. Have a great day.